Here we will discuss the second main topic in Chapter 2. Chapter 2 discusses descriptive tables and graphs, and in the last video we talked about categorical variables, and in this video we're going to talk about summarizing, summarizing quantitative data. Again, we will talk about frequency distributions, percent frequency and percent, uh, rel and, I'm sorry, relative frequency distributions and percent frequency distributions. The concepts here are almost the same as the concepts that we saw when we were summarizing categorical data. Your textbook covers dot plots. I will not cover those in this video. I will, however, cover histograms. A histogram is basically like a bar chart, but it applies to quantitative data rather than to categorical data. I will talk about cumulative distributions as well. Cumulative distributions can be calculated for both quantitative data and categorical data. Your textbook also covers stem and leaf displays. You can read about those in your textbook. I will not cover them in this video. Here's an example of a frequency distribution for Walmart data. Here I've used the weekly sales uh, variable and I've calculated a frequency distribution for weekly sales which you will recall is, of course, a quantitative variable. The difference between constructing a frequency distribution like the one you see here and the frequency distribution that we calculated in the previous video is that there are no natural classes or categories for this quantitative variable. I had to determine the classes and the categories on the left-hand side of the table myself. That process is a process that's known as binning the data. Here I've chosen 14 different classes. What's important in choosing the classes is that you have enough classes so that they're populated and they represent the distribution of the data well. Uh, but having too many classes um, also is suboptimal. So finding the right number of classes can often be a matter of trial and error. I'll point out just a couple other things about the conventions in looking at frequency distributions. It really is up to you to decide the number of bins that you have, and here you can see my bins go in increments of 10,000. In choosing these bins, it's important to know the maximum value in your data set and the minimum value in the data set so that you can capture all of the information that's in the data set when you bin the data and, cre data and create your own categories. Here I picked nice round increments of uh, $10,000. So zero to $10,000 of sales is the first category. 10,000 to 20,000 is the second category, et cetera, all the way up to 130 to $140,000 worth of weekly sales. It looks like there's an overlap in these categories. In other words, where would you put $60,000 worth of sales? This is the way that frequency distributions are represented in Excel, so I've adopted the same procedure here, but you should know that there really is no overlap. A value of 60,000 would go into this category. If you had a value of 100,000, for example, the 100,000 would go into the higher category here. Again, I have calculated both the frequency and the relative frequency in percent the calculations once you have binned the data are exactly the same as the calculations in the previous presentation of frequency distributions for categorical data. The 45.2% relative frequency here is equal to the 33 frequency count divided by the total number of observations in the data set which is equal to 73. There are 73 different departments in this Walmart store. Then we take that value and we multiply it by 100 to eliminate the decimal point to get the relative frequency. So the three steps that are necessary in defining the classes for a frequency distribution with quantitative data are as follows. First, you have to determine the number of non-overlapping classes. Again, as I mentioned, this is often a matter of trial and error. 
The second thing is to determine the width of each class, and I recommend keeping the width of each class constant. Then you determine the class limits, in other words, the lower end of each class and the upper end of each class. Here's an example, Hudson Auto Repair, a sample of parts cost for 50 different tune-ups. So n is equal to 50. We have 50 observations in this data set. It's hard to discern much about this data just from looking at this ta oh, table, <coughs> excuse me, but we will be able to use our descriptive measures in order to learn more about the aspects of our data. The guidelines here for determining the number of classes are to use between 5 and 20 classes. Less than 5 classes is usually suboptimal, as it doesn't allow us to see the true distribution of the data across various bins or classes. In 20, you're getting to a lot of classes, and some of the classes may be empty which is suboptimal in trying to learn about the distribution of the data. Data sets with a larger number of elements will usually require a larger number of classes. In other words, if you have a lot of observations, you can typically get away with a larger number of classes. Smaller data sets usually require fewer classes. The goal, again, is to use enough classes to show the variation of the data but not so many classes that some of the classes contained few uh, data items or are empty. The guidelines for determining the width of each class are as follows. Use class widths that are equal. The class width will be equal to the biggest data value in your data set minus the smallest value in the data set. That's called the range of the data, divided by the number of classes that you desire. Making the classes the same width will reduce the chance of inappropriate interpretations of the data. So here's an example back to Hudson Auto Repair. I'm going to first calculate a frequency distribution, and I'm going to choose six classes. This, these six classes would be picked uh, based perhaps on trial and error. I may have tried three classes and thought it was too few, and tried ten classes and thought it was too many but feel that a representation with six classes seems to do the data justice. Once I've picked the six classes, I can figure out the class width by taking the maximum cost of auto parts in a repair, which is 109, minus the minimum, which was 52, and dividing it by six, where six again is equal to the number of classes that we desire. That gives me a class width of 9.5, using a decimal would be sort of odd and inconvenient, so I just round it up to 10, and I use a class width of 10. I choose to start my uh, uh, frequency distribution at 50, and I'll capture all of the different repairs that cost between 50 and $60, and there were two of those. Right. And, and really, this is, this is 59.99, right? Because if it's $60, it will spill over into the next class, which goes from $60 to $69.99. There were 13 of those. And the next one goes from 70 to 79.99. There were 16 of those, etc. And when I add up all of the different frequencies that show up in each one of my binned categories, I come up with the size of the data set, which you will recall is equal to 50. In order to calculate a relative frequency distribution and a percent frequency distribution, we follow exactly the same steps, steps that we did when we calculated relative and percent frequency distributions for categorical variables. For example, we had two auto, part, two auto repairs that cost between $50 and $60. If I divide that two by the total size of the data set, I will get the frequency. That frequency is equal to 0.04. So 0.04 is equal to 2 divided by 50. 0.26 is equal to 13 divided by 50, etc. I do that for each one of my classes, and if I add up the relative frequency across all of my classes, once again, the total should be equal to 1. In order to present these as percentages, I simply get rid of the decimal point by multiplying each one of the values in the relative frequency column by 100. So 0.04 times 100 
is 4%. 0.26 times 100 is 26%, etc. If I add up all of the percent frequencies that are associated with each one of my categories in my binned data, I should come up with a total of 100%, which I do. A histogram is a graph that presents the same information that is presented in the frequency distribution, and it looks a lot like a bar chart. Another common graphic display for quantitative data, then, is a histogram, and a histogram will show us the distribution of the data. Again, the variable of interest is typically placed on the horizontal axis, and a rectangle is drawn above each one of the class intervals with its height corresponding to either the frequency, that is the count of the number of observations that fall within that class, the relative frequency, where we've taken the frequency and divided by the sample size, or the percent frequency, where we have taken the relative frequency and we have multiplied it by 100. Unlike a bar graph, a histogram has no real natural separation points, so we typically don't separate the, uh, the rectangles in the histogram by any space. So here is an example of a histogram for the Walmart data that we saw e uh, earlier in a frequency distribution for weekly sales. And we can learn a lot about the data by looking at my 14 class frequency distribution plotted as a histogram. It's quite clear that most of the Walmart departments have sales that are down below 20,000. And we can also see that the data here tends to take on a distribution where most of the values are on the left, and then there are some values that tend to taper off to the right. We say that a distribution that follows this shape is skewed to the right. Here are a couple of other definitions that are useful. This is a symmetric distribution. You can see with a symmetric distribution that there's a peak in the middle. And the values that are, to the, uh, uh, that are higher than the peak or the below the peak tend to be evenly distributed to either side of the peak. That's a symmetric distribution. A distribution where a lot of the values uh, and the peak in the distribution are sort of to the right and then there are values that sort of taper off as we move back here to the left. It's called the left skewed distribution. When we talk about probability theory and the distribution of test statistics, we will be very interested in knowing whether or not our variables have a left skewed distribution, a right skewed distribution, or a symmetric distribution. Coming back to the main topic here, which is descriptive statistics uh, and histograms, Let's look at Hudson Auto Repair again. Here is a frequency distribution that we already built. It counts the number of auto repairs that have parts costs in these different categories that we chose ourselves to bit when we binned the data. We chose six different categories. And then we counted up the number of auto repairs that fell within each category. We can graph that data in uh, a frequency distribution. This is a, uh, the scale here on the vertical axis is the frequency of the counts, but we could just as easily have used the relative frequency or the percent relative frequency. I would also point out that there's no space that we put in between the different classes on the horizontal axis. That's because this is a quantitative variable, and there's really no natural separation between these different classes on the horizontal axis. They butt right up against each other. The first class going from 50 to 59.99999, the second class going from 60 to 69.999, etc. We can see from looking at the uh, histogram that the data looks like it's skewed a little bit to the right. We can also see that a majority of uh, the auto repairs have parts costs between $70 and $79. That's the most common category.
So we're starting to pull out um, some key features of our data from using these descriptive statistics. We can also calculate cumulative distributions. To calculate a cumulative distribution, we look at the number of items with values less than or equal to the upper limit of each class. Cumulative relative frequency distributions just show the proportion of items with values less than or equal to the upper limit of each class. And cumulative percent frequency distributions so they show the cumulative percentage. These are quite easily calculated, not just for quantitative variables, but for categorical variables as well. The last entry in a cumulative frequency distribution will always be equal to the number of observations. And it'll be obvious that the last entry in a cumulative relative frequency distribution will always be equal to 1. And the last entry in a cumulative relative, uh, cumulative percent, percent frequency distribution, excuse me, will always be equal to 100. Here's an example from my Walmart data again. You will recall that I already showed you how to calculate the relative uh, percent frequencies based on my 14 categories that I chose to represent the data. In order to calculate the cumulative relative frequency distribution, I simply go to each class, I add up uh, the relative frequency for that class and all of the previous classes. So for example, 45.2 is where I start out in my, relative, uh, my cumulative relative frequency distribution. In other words, 45.2% of the observations are at or below 10,000. In order to calculate the next entry in my cumulative relative frequency distribution, I add together the 45.2% and the 20.5% to come up with my 65.7%. And that is to say that 65.7% of the observations have values of 20,000 or less. Likewise, if I wanted to calculate the cumulative relative frequency distribution for 40 to 50, or in other words, the number of observations that have a value of 50,000 or less, I would sum together the, 80, the uh, uh, 4 0.1% uh, with all of the previous values. Or I could simply take the 4.1% and add it to the previous cumulative relative frequency and get an answer of 86.2%. 86.2% of the observations taking on values that are 50,000 or less. Here is a graph of that cumulative relative frequency distribution. And you can see that the cumulative relative frequency distribution graph never falls because we're adding uh, numbers cumulatively or adding them up over time. So it just continues to rise until it approaches 100% of the observations. Here's an example from Hudson Auto Repair. You have your frequency table, and we want to calculate the cumulative frequency. The cumulative frequency will be equal to, the first entry will be equal to 2. That is the number that's less than or equal to 59. That's our first category from 50 to 60. Those that are less than or equal to 69 would be all of the, the uh, observations that are in the first uh, class of, of 50 to 60 plus those that are in the second class of 60 to 70. So that would be 13 plus 2 which we know is equal to 15. The number of observations in our cumulative frequency distribution that are less than or equal to 79 will be found by taking those that are in the category from 70 to 79.999. Remember my convention about labeling these. That's 16 in that category. The 16 plus the 13 plus the 2 that were in the first category give me my answer of 31, etc. And as we mentioned in a previous slide, if I add up all of these values, I'll come up with the size of the sample. We can do the same thing for our cumulative relative frequency distribution. We can either start with our cumulative relative frequency distribution, or we can, at each step, 
take each one of these cumulative frequencies and divide it by 50 before we do our addition. 30%, for example, of the observations lie uh, uh, with a value that is uh, less than or equal to 69. That is the percentage that come from the 60 to 70 category plus the percentage that come from the 50 to 60 category. And as mentioned on a previous slide, all of those cumulative relative frequencies will add up to 1. And if we multiply them by 100%, we will have our cumulative percent frequency, and that will add up to 100%.